This video looks at how output constraints can be included into a simple PFC law. So video 6 showed how you could handle input constraints using a simple saturation policy. And this was valid because within the predictions it was assumed that the future input is constant. With output constraints you cannot use such a simple strategy, so I'll underline that word cannot, because the output values are continually changing within the predictions. Nevertheless, given that PFC utilizes just one degree of freedom, the current control move, then constraint handling can still be reduced to a very simple few lines of code, and that's what we will illustrate here. As with the rest of this chapter, this video is only considering first order systems so that we can focus on concepts rather than algebra. High order systems will come later. So this is just a reminder <coughs> of our basic structure, which is where we have a process which is working in parallel with a system model. Now in this particular case, we're going to need the model and we're going to need the bias term unlike in the previous video because we're going to have to form predictions explicitly. The bias term is given by the difference between the process output and the model output at the current sample. So PFC predictions. Consider a first order model, something like this, and this has predictions with a constant input like this. Now we've done the predictions umpteen times so we won't dwell on that one. And Consequently the predicted process output is given like this. Now if you've missed the difference here, the first one here is model. So if I put that there, that's model. Whereas this one down here is process. And if you're saying well what's the difference? The main difference is just this term at the end. In order to get the process outputs we're just adding the bias term onto the model predictions. But we need to do that because we need predictions for the process outputs, not for the model outputs, because constraints apply to process outputs, not model outputs. So objectives. Notwithstanding the default choice for U of K from the PFC control law, we've got constraints we want to satisfy. We want to make sure that the input doesn't violate an upper constraint. The input doesn't violate a lower constraint. The output doesn't violate an upper constraint. Now notice, although these are only basically one constraint, this one down here is many because you're going to have to do k equals 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. The output needs to satisfy a lower constraint, again for all different future samples. The input has to satisfy a rate constraint, upper and lower. Now you'll notice I've put these in a very particular order because if you do them in this order you only need to do them once. So first check inputs against upper and lower limits and if needs be reduce them. And then check whether satisfying output constraints requires you to change the inputs even further. And only in the very last step do you look at rate constraints because it could well be that by the time you've done the first four even if rate constraints were violated at the outset they might not be violated by the time you've done the first four. Here we're going to assume a feasible UK exists to satisfy the requirements and in particular we're going to assume that you can always choose the input to be the same as its previous value. Now that's a weak assumption in general where you have disturbances and uncertainty but to give a guaranteed feasibility is very challenging indeed and we really don't want to go there. Summary of input constraints. So the coding for input constraints is very, very simple, and this was done in video 1.6. So next we want to think about how do we satisfy output constraints. So practitioners in PFC will often code an inner loop. So in essence, they will simulate what might happen in the future and emulate closed loop predictions and use this to establish limits on UK. However, this can be quite inefficient in that one is repeatedly performing computations that could be done offline. So, personally speaking, I prefer to use matrix vector algebra to represent the scenario 
and maximize the use of offline computations. So what you're doing online is as simple as possible. So predictions then. Now I'm going to use open loop predictions, which is based upon the fact that the future input is going to be constant. So the predictions, we've already done these, are given by this equation here. Now what we can do is stack these in using a matrix vector form, which gives explicit dependence on measured data, that's the process and the model output, and the decision variable, that's UK. And what you'll find is when you go to higher order examples, doing this offline and forming these matrix vector um, types makes life a little bit easier. So we'll demonstrate how you can do this for a first order model. So if we go up to n steps ahead, then you can see I can stack YPK plus 1 all the way down to YK plus N using these equations over here. Now there's nothing different there from the standard predictions, so if you need to look at this slowly, just pause the video and hopefully you'll realise it's obvious. Now the thing you might want to notice is I've defined a matrix H here, I've defined a matrix P and a matrix L, because I want that notation to make my life just a little bit easier in the long term. So what I can do is I can now write that the predictions from the first sample to the end sample can be written as matrix H times the UK, matrix P times the model output, plus this L, which is your bias term. If I want to do an individual prediction, say I steps ahead, then I can extract the I through of H, the I through of P, and just add the bias term on the end. So our constraints are given as y min less than yk less than y max. So each of these gives an implicit constraint on uk. So this is how we're going to do it. We're going to write that y min is less than, and what you'll notice, all I've done here is I've written down, if I put this big circle, this term here is just the prediction for yp i steps into the future. You'll see I've just taken the prediction from the previous sample. Now, I've also put in a shorthand here, which I'm going to use in the MATLAB code to make life easier. You'll see this particular term in here, which doesn't depend upon UK. So once you've made your measurements, it becomes fixed. I've called this YFI because that makes everything a little bit a bit more compact. So once I've computed these YFI, I can reduce the constraints to this form here. That Y min minus YFI is less than or equal to HI times UK is less than or equal to Y max minus YFI. And obviously this is for I equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. As many samples as you think you need to do. Now, I've put two cases here, HI greater than zero and HI less than zero. So you need to do that because the way the constraints, if I go back here, the way that these constraints can be satisfied with simple algebra does depend upon the sign of HI. So if HI is greater than naught, then you can rewrite these constraints as this, Y min minus YFI of HI less than or equal to UK, less than or equal to y max minus yfi over hi. And again, you have to do this for i equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. If hi is less than naught, then when you divide by it, you get a change in sign. And therefore, we end up with equalities a bit like this. So that is a subtlety you need to be careful of in your code. But you'll notice that each output prediction leads to two constraints two additional constraints on the current value of the input. So a summary of limits in coding. Ideally, you need an efficient mechanism to test for all the limits. So what I'm suggesting is you do it like this. First, you ensure that you, the U satisfies upper and lower limits. Then you check the output constraints. And these ones, you remember, you have to do for I equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. And finally, you check rate constraints. And the idea is that each of these can potentially make the constraints tighter. The other thing is that given we've made the assumption that UK minus 1 should always be feasible 
then we should not end up in a situation where we cannot satisfy all of these. Now here is an example of the code which is provided in, uh, on the Google Sites for you. You can see the name of the file up there, PFC first order model underscore output constraints. So the ordering is quite simple. First of all, we do our control law and we get what's the default value for UK. And then we say, does it satisfy input constraints, upper and lower limits? And we check that. Next, in this particular box here, we are doing output constraints. Now you'll notice, because we have to check these over a number of samples, I've got a loop for k equals 1 to horizon, where you need to specify how far into the future you want to check these constraints. And you'll notice that I've calculated this yf type i term here. I've called it yf brackets kk. And then if you look at the particular algebra, you'll see that this algebra matches exactly what was on the previous slide. And finally, last step is you check rate constraints. But hopefully you'll look at that and you'll say, actually, to do constraint handling, I've got absolute constraints, output constraints, and rate constraints, and I've managed to reduce the code on a single page here, and hopefully you'll say, that doesn't look too bad. I could manage that. OK. So some numerical examples. And we'll deliberately introduce some parameter uncertainty into this, just to make life interesting. So we've got a model and some process uncertainty. And as ever, we've allowed for a delay, m not equal to 0, if we want it. You'll see we've got absolute constraints on inputs, absolute constraints on rates, and we've also got output constraints. And the code for this is in video 1.8 PFC EX1. And what that does is it calls a particular file at the bottom, PFC first order model underscore output constraints. So here's the first example. And what do you notice? I have plotted here unconstrained and constrained so that you can see the difference. If no constraints are applied, you get this blue plot for the input. Um, whereas when you apply the constraints, you end up with this green plot. Now, what's particularly interesting is the target here is 1. And you can see that from the unconstrained output. But because we've put an output constraint of 0 0.8, what do you notice? You notice that that constraint has been rig rigorously enforced, and the output has only gone to 0 0.8. There is some small output um, violations, and you can see those around here. And that happens because you've got parameter uncertainty, so that your predictions are not perfect. And that's unavoidable with outputs. You cannot have perfect predictions. Now, what about including dead time? Well, including dead time doesn't really change much. You'll see that all we've done is we've replaced the bias term, as we've discussed before, by that term there. And otherwise, the algebra is exactly the same. So I'm not going to go through that. You can pause and you can look. But all we've done is change the bias term. And here again, you see that even though there is an obvious dead time in this particular example, the output constraints and the input constraints have been satisfied apart from a small violation there, which is linked to parameter uncertainty. And so the constraint handling has worked with very simple code. So a summary. We've demonstrated that an elementary PFC algorithm deals with output constraints in a relatively easy and systematic fashion. The key modification is to add some simple if statements to the code to ensure limits are satisfied. And examples with parameter uncertainty in large dead times demonstrate the efficacy. But there is a warning here. You cannot guarantee output constraints in general because of uncertainty. And if you really did want to guarantee them, you, this is quite an advanced topic and requires very complex coding. So it doesn't really fit with the general um, idea of PFC, which is to keep things simple.